welcome you to the 2021 Franciscan Zoom Lecture Series hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Ilya Delio, OSF, is a Franciscan sister of Washington, D.C., and holds the Josephine C. Connolly Chair in Christian Theology at Villanova University. Her area of research is science and religion, with interests in artificial intelligence, evolution, quantum physics, and the import of these for Christian doctrine and life. She is the author of over 23 books, including Making All Things New, Catholicity, Cosmology, and Consciousness, a finalist for the 2019 Michael Ramsey Prize, and The Unbearable Wholeness of Being, God, Evolution, and the Power of Love, for which she won the 2014 Silver Novelist Book Award and a 2014 Catholic Press Association Book Award in Faith and Science. She is founder of the Center for Christogenesis, an online education resource for promoting the vision of Teilhard de Chardin, and more broadly, the integration of science and religion in the 21st century. I welcome Sister Ilya. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be with you. So I do have um, um, a few remarks I'd like to share with you this evening on Franciscans in an age of science. You know, many of you know that um, I began as a Franciscan theologian, and I think at heart, I am a Franciscan theologian, for sure. I'm a Franciscan theologian who has a vested interest in science, and a lot of my work has tried to bring together, uh, you might say, the best of Franciscan theology um, in a world of evolution and quantum physics. And so what can we learn from this wonderful tradition on how to go forth in an age of science? Well, I think many of us know that we are living in very challenging times. Uh, right now, we are dealing with a global pandemic that seems to elude uh, some, some of the best science in some ways. Uh, we know that global warming is um, a vital problem for us in, insofar as the earth continues to warm. And um, I know that many Franciscans have been involved in works of peace and social justice, um, the uh, movement for equity, uh, for overcoming racism, for care of the poor, and for um, just how to bring about, you might say, a better world uh, uh, that we call the reign of God. And so this is the work of, I think, that truly belongs to um, the Franciscan spirit. But I think what tonight, uh, what I want to do is kind of say, well, is what we're doing um, the best that we can do? Or is there something more we should be doing um, in the world in which we're living? To do that, I want to just kind of recap for ourselves the fact that we come from a medieval tradition, um, a tradition that was inaugurated in the um, 12th century and uh, kind of theologized in the 13th century and, and grew into many different variations on a theme um, by the 20th and 21st century. Um, but this, this tradition of ours was really, is really grounded in the um, ancient cosmos. Um, here is the ancient Hebraic cosmos, but very similar to the Ptolemaic cosmos. And so um, many theologians in the Middle Ages tried to understand how a creator God could is sustainer um, of the world, the geometry of the world, and of course developed uh, based on Greek metaphysics and the influence of Greek thinking on Christianity led to what we call a hierarchy or a great chain of being that um, sometimes is referred to as Neoplatonism or primacy of the spiritual over the material. Um, and, and, and so far as uh, the earth is good, but as we climb up the ladder from stones to plants to humans, uh, the spiritual life or the spirit uh, prevails. 
And so on the Neoplatonic ladder of ascent, um, humans have in a sense more being over plants and stones. And of course, God is perfect being. And this kind of led to, although, although the 13th century, and, and, and certainly we see with even Bonaventure, um, creation holds a goodness that God creates out of, um, out of an abundance of the good. Yet there's a primacy of uh, the spiritual, and in a sense, an emphasis on the spiritual over the material. And the reason I say this is because Francis of Assisi uh, was not a Greek thinker by any means. He was a very simple man, as we know. And therefore, he was not plagued by uh, the rise of scholasticism or many of the um, metaphysical discussions that were prevailing. Uh, Francis was, uh, as we know, a cloth merchant coming from a merchant class family in Assisi. And therefore, we might say someone who was very earthy. Uh, I think many of us know the story of his being wounded in battle, uh, his recovery in a hospital, and his meeting of a God of overflowing love in the cross of Jesus Christ in that broken down church. And I think this is what I want to maybe emphasize here is that for Francis, uh, the incarnation um, revealed to him the kind of God he was in relationship with. Um, and therefore he discovered a God of overflowing goodness, the most high good, humbly bending low in goodness out of love for us. And uh, what I see with Francis, which I think is, and is not brought out enough in our tradition, is that the material world for him held infinite uh, goodness. It, it was, in a sense, the place where God had revealed God's self. Um, we know the famous idea that Francis saw the footprints of God impressed on creation. The sand, the water, the stars, the sun, all spoke to him of God's indwelling presence. And of course, he discovered that indwelling presence of God deep within his own life. And as he came into that center of God, we might say, in his, in his life, he realized that the source of his life was the source of all created life, all created things. And that's what turned his mind around from, you know, being not just a person, but a brother, right? A deeply relational person. And here, I think we can say that Francis makes a conversion, a shift from being an individual to being a person, a relational being. Um, and I think as Francis spent a lot of time in nature, and I have to tell you, I. I have been in um, recovering from a head injury and I've had to spend a lot of time off the computer and not writing. And I have began to reflect on Francis in new ways because this kind of what we might call wasting time, uh, today we would call it, you know, like not spending time fruitfully. And, but for Francis, it was fruitful. Uh, he would just wander into fields and spend long periods just mindful of God's presence. Uh, he, he filled up with that presence in a source of joy as he just beheld the things of the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, and therefore, as we well know, scripture uh, was a living word for him. It wasn't just a letter. It was the living presence of Christ. And so, uh, you know, that, that livingness of the word of God was alive within him, uh, that he, he began to focus. He was a very uh, single-minded, single-hearted person that made Jesus the center of his life. And I love this passage from uh, Thomas of Chalano. Jesus was always on his lips. He was always with Jesus in his heart, in his mouth, in his ears, in his eyes, in his hands. He bore Jesus always in his whole body. That kind of focusing on the mind uh, and therefore overcoming all distractions by centering oneself um, in the person of Jesus was really part of Francis's conversion. Um, in that centering of his life in Christ, he also lived 
um, in a way that he began to dispossess himself of anything he held onto, whether it was material things, uh, whether it was his relationships with others, including his father, he let go. And this is part of the Franciscan charism. Poverty is not so much living without things, but without possessing things. Um, uh, and therefore, it is a recognition and a calling to mind that we do not control our own existence. Um, this kind of living sine proprio without possessing allowed Francis to recognize the goodness of God in just the simple ordinariness of being. When we're not trying to control things, we can let things be. And therefore, in that letting be, we can allow things to shine through their own goodness. And therefore, everything became a gift for him. And he recognized that just in the simple, ordinary things of life, he was truly blessed in the richness of life and lived with gratitude and love. This notion of brotherhood is one, of course, that Pope Francis has picked up in La Dauto Si and Fratelli Tutti. Um, but uh, we use the term a little bit too lightly. Uh, you know, Francis saw himself as a brother. A brother, I think, is a structure, a relationship that Francis of himself grew into. Uh, it's not something like a title that, you know, he took for himself. As he, in a sense, descended in solidarity with all of creation, he found that the God of his life was the God of all life. And that's how he identified, therefore, with all the creatures of creation. And I guess in this growth into brotherhood, into fraternity, into community, um, and living in the giftedness of creation, he recognized that nothing in nature is accidental or trivial or worthless. This is something, again, Pope Francis has picked up in Laudato Si. No matter how small or seemingly insignificant, everything has infinite value or had infinite value for Francis because every material thing from the smallest grain of sand to a rock to a leaf on a tree reflected God in its own beingness. So I always use this because Thomas of Chilato wrote, you know, even for worms, Francis had a warm love. Since he read in the text, I am a worm and not a man. And therefore he used to pick them up from the road and put them in a safe place so they would not be crushed by others. Or when he found flowers, he used to preach to them and invite them to praise the Lord as if they were endowed with reason. I think Francis, and, and we will expand this a little bit, but there's something about the material world here that I think we have not attended to sufficiently. The, the, the world of creation for Francis, the world of nature was truly alive with the presence of God. Um, and therefore, even at the end of his life, as he sings, you know, the canticle of preachers, um, he, he doesn't pray to God. He's, pray, he's praising God with and through uh, Brother Wind and uh, Sister Water and Sister Mother Earth. Materiality was spirituality for Francis. Uh, and, um, you know, what that led to for him is the idea of a sacramental world, the holiness of the world. Uh, meant that any place or thing that caused him and us to notice God's love and dynamizes all that exists is a sacrament. Uh, there are not just seven sacraments. There are seven billion sacraments, so to speak. The world is a sacramental world as Francis saw the world with his eyes. Or as the uh, poet Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Well, you know, we say this, uh, and it, it, it's very much very attractive to us, but the fact is we are living in a world that's blowing up. Uh, we're living in a world that's very divided. And part of that division is because after the rise of the Middle Ages, uh, in the rise of modernity, 
um, after the great Bonaventure in Duns Scotus were laid to rest, um, religion, the church, uh, took off in a different trajectory from the world of modern science. And it really came with the discovery of first heliocentrism with uh, Copernicus, and then later with evolution and the Big Bang. But the church has really stayed with the medieval construct of Thomas Aquinas and a little bit of Bonaventure. Um, and it has not really entered into uh, the cosmology that is now ours today. And so we have to be careful when juxtaposing a medieval tradition onto the world in which we live today. Of course, the, the split between religion and science was enhanced by Descartes' um, uh, dualism, where he, Descartes seeking, seeking certain knowledge, seeking the certainty of knowledge, split the world of ideas from the world of matter. So in a sense, Descartes, uh, his philosophy, basically unraveled the Franciscan uh, holism that Francis himself um, uh, realized in his own time. And Newton's world built on Descartes' world of inert matter. Descartes' world basically stripped matter of any good. Newton's world built on inert matter as being just lawful and orderly. And the world therefore was seen like a machine or like a clockwork. Uh, God was like a deus God, you know, retracted from the world and in a sense, fine tuning the world periodically. But we built our modern world basically on the Newtonian paradigm. Everything works like a clock. Therefore, everything must have predictability. Everything must have some kind of objectivity to it. Uh, nature itself became a place of manipulation and control. And of course, science just began to conquer nature in a sense that it stripped, you might say, the mystery of nature. Um, and when we can take any parts of nature and name it, identify it, and then reduce it to its components, we lose the depth dimension of nature that spoke so highly to Francis of Assisi. So we have become from the 18th century right into the, our own 21st century, we're a people in a sense split apart from the earth that was a whole in the time of Francis of Assisi. The great medieval synthesis saw that harmony between heaven and earth, modern science and modern philosophy split this harmony into, into discordant parts. And therefore, it, it, it behooves us to really pay attention to what modern science has to say to us today. Because uh, there's, if we can enter into um, the main insights from modern science, we can, in a sense, revitalize the Franciscan charism for the world in which we're living. Uh, as we know today from the early 20th century on, um, this is not a static uh, fixed universe. This is a, what we call today, a hot big bang universe that began about 13.8 billion years ago, um, very, very far back. And as a small, hot, dense of matter that basically rapidly expanded and then cooled over time um, and has been expanding ever since. So our universe is still expanding into an infinite uh, future and it's held together by dark matter. So the dark energy is the energy expansion, dark matter, the a matter that keeps us together, so to speak. One of the most uh, significant findings of the early 20th century was the fact that matter is not inert stuff. It's not substance, which is how many people still think about matter. Matter, rather, is a form of energy. And this, of course, comes from Einstein's special theory of relativity. Um, and that's really, we have yet to get our heads around that, uh, that matter and energy are two forms of the same stuff. Um, and so the world of quantum physics has opened to us a whole new understanding of this material world as a world of deep interconnected um, level fields of energy. So um, we live not so much in a world of things, we live in a world of 
potentialities. That's in a sense what quantum physics means, that um, the world that we call stuff or matter is really a world of potentialities that is brought into actuality by the act of observation or the role of consciousness. Since it takes an act of consciousness to make a determination of uh, whether something is a wave or a particle. Um, all of this to say is that quantum physics has really, I think, radicalized our world uh, in a way that we have yet to really fully get our heads around. For one thing, quantum physics tells us that reality is non-local. Nature is not composed of material substances, but deeply entangled fields of energy. So that the nature of the universe is undivided wholeness. I think Francis of Assisi would have been very much at home with the insights from quantum physics. Um, we also learned from quantum physics that it is a world of entanglement. This word entanglement means that once particles have interacted, they will forever be interacting. So the experiment done in the early 20th century was that if you take two particles whose spins cancel each other to zero and you separate them and put one particle, say, on my desk here in Washington and turn it up, and I put another particle on the moon and turn it down, that if I if I turn this particle in Washington up, the particle on the moon will reciprocally turn downward. So quantum entanglement means that, that interactive states um, affect one another. We call this non-local action at a distance. And scientists have gone on to show that it's not just particles that are interacting, but consciousness interacts as well. So a thought in one part of the universe can affect um, someone's thinking in another part of the universe uh, if these two particles have somewhere interacted. So um, David Bohm, the physicist and contemporary of Einstein said, as human beings and societies, we seem separate, but in our roots, we are part of an indivisible whole and share in the same cosmic process. And, and that, you know, I think is alluring to us because it says our root reality is wholeness. Uh, and the word Catholicity, of course, means according to the whole. We can say the universe is Catholic in the broadest sense. I think the other part of modern physics that has really has us thinking in a new way today is that the mind or consciousness is not something separate from matter. Um, Max Planck, the famous physicist of the early 20th century said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness. No consciousness, no matter. That's basically how it goes. No consciousness, it would be even hard to say that God exists or does not exist. Everything pre uh, begins with consciousness. Um, and therefore, what science are beginning to realize today is that what accounts for the human mind is active in the universe. The stuff that allows us to know that we know is also active in all other aspects of life in the universe. This, of course, led the Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin to realize that um, our theology uh, no longer speaks to the world in which we're living. He was, Teilhard was um, a, paleo, a paleontologist. Uh, evolution was his area of expertise. Um, he was very familiar with the physicists of his own age. Um, and therefore he began to try to bring together Christianity and evolution in a way that would revitalize the Christian faith for a world in evolution. So he asks the question, who will give evolution its own God? The question of course is telling that we do not have a God of evolution. We have a God that's very consonant with the 13th century and the medieval cosmos. 
But if we go back and we realize that, you know, we're living in this um, expanding universe, we have to ask ourselves, just if I go back there, what's pushing it along? How do we emerge here? And Teilhard posited that there is a principle within in nature that is both moving nature or or both both pushing it and pulling it. And he called this principle omega and eventually God omega. And he said this, uh, this omega, this principle of wholeness, the centriety of love, we might say, both can account for a radial energy or an energy of attraction and a tangential, rather a tangential energy, which is an energy of attraction and a radial energy. Basically, we're saying that there is an energy within evolution that keeps pulling things together and pulling the new unities into something more. So, so life in this evolutionary universe is a life towards moreness. And Teilhard would say it is resting on the future as its sole support, that future being God Omega. Teilhard also recognized that the core energy of the universe is love. And he, he did not mean uh, the emotion of love. He meant the attractive energy of love. And he said, no matter how far down you go down the ladder from the smallest particles, there's an attractability in nature. Um, and love is both attractive and unitive, attraction and uni union, which characterizes in a sense, all forms of life um, from the quantum world upwards. Um, Teilhard also, of course, realize that this is a world of evolution. In other words, we are not living in a static, fixed, mechanistic universe. We're living in one that is open, dynamic, and changing, a world that is in process, that is becoming something. And that's the key here. Um, what, of course, we realize with evolution, and this is really important for us, and I think Francis would have been quite at home with this, nature is marked by change not stability. Uh, the kind of change that marks nature is what we call um, irreducible novelty. New things emerge over time. Time itself is irreversible. We can't go backwards, um, nor do we even stay still. Time and, uh, time and space are a function of motion, of movement. So nature is a complex of interacting forces in organic interdependence and that is moving according to both lawfulness and chance. Finally, in evolution, it's good to remember that it's all unfinished, that we emerge from a long process of evolution. We ourselves are in the process of evolution and we are moving towards something through the process of evolution. We live in an unfinished life. And so Teilhard um, really reflected deeply on these, these aspects of evolution as a Jesuit, um, as one like Francis with a deep incarnational heart. And Teilhard realized that consciousness is rising in evolution as the material world complexifies. So we move from small particles, leptons and quarks, to single cellular to multicellular things uh, through plants and animal life into human life. Consciousness is part of this all the way, but increasing in complexity as complex life emerges. So we humans emerge out of a long process of evolving life. What distinguishes us in a sense is that we know that we know we can step apart from this process and reflect on it. And yet, I think what Teilhard and, uh, you know, realized is that there's a power here pushing this process. There's something that's just more than consciousness itself. And he saw incarnation as, you might say, the central uh, mystery, <laughs> the depth mystery of this evolving cosmos. And of course, Teilhard <laughs> saw uh, evolution and religion as two dimensions of the same movement. Religion is not something that's, you might say, layered onto us. Religion is organic for Teilhard. It's the depth dimension of, 
of all that exists. <coughs> Excuse me. So incarnation, meaning that God empties God's self, becomes element, and draws all things through love into a fullness of being. I think what I want to emphasize here for Teilhard, as for Francis of Assisi, that God is not found through opposition to matter or independent of matter, but through matter. We take hold of God in the finite. So to Teilhard, uh, very much in the spirit of Francis of Assisi, had that direct experience of God in and through the material world. Father Thomas King writes, in the direct experience of the cosmos, Teilhard believed he found an absolute that drew him and yet remained in hiddenness. He seemed, he seemed to sink down into matter, the primordial essence from which all emerges into which all returns. Matter, mattering, you might say, the depths of God. And so Teilhard begins to describe a, a dynamic process of Christ and evolution. Uh, God, he says, is not just creating, but as God creates, God enters into that which God, uh, God creates, God incarnates. And as, God, as, this, as this enfolding God uh, is, is pulling all things together, we have this process of redemption or, or union, um, this kind of unity uh, emerging up into a conscious awareness of Christ. Christogenesis, the birthing of the Christ. Um, and therefore, what, what Teilhard brings to us, uh, and I think this is very consonant with the Franciscan charism, um, to the roots of Francis of Assisi. God and the world are in the process of becoming something more together because the universe is grounded in the personal center of love incarnate or the Christ. Now, Teilhard de Jardin discovered um, the primacy of Christ uh, um, late in life, around 1950, from, I believe, a conventional Franciscan, Father Allegra, or, or um, not a conventional, he might have been a cap, a capuchin, but I can't remember, I think it's conventional. Anyway, he was a Sicilian. Um, and whereas Scoda said, you know, whether or not there was ever a sin, Christ would have come, Teilhard would fully agree with that, and went on to say that Christ is the form of the universe and, and that which the universe is tending toward, the fullness of Christ, a very Pauline idea. And so um, he did not write, neither Teilhard, and I might add Francis of Assisi, wrote much about Jesus of Nazareth. Teilhard, very sparingly, Francis of Assisi, he mentions Jesus three times in, in all his writings. So, I mean, I think that's really interesting because so many people place a lot of emphasis on um, uh, the public ministry of Jesus, which is quite, you know, it's good in itself, but we have to see Jesus within the bigger picture, which is what Teilhard does. He sees Jesus in a sense emerging as one with a higher consciousness, um, a deeper sense of relatedness, and therefore a sense of wholeness. Um, I think for our purposes, we can say that Jesus is sort of like a new big bang in the universe, bringing, um, you know, a faithful Jew who's bringing a sense of newness in himself, um, a new direction in evolution, a power of newness and creativity. Um, and so I think, you know, very much like Francis of Assisi, Jesus was empowered by the spirit of God, you know, his walking into the temple and saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, reading from the prophet Isaiah very much like Francis of Assisi, feeling that power of the spirit in his own life and being directed by the spirit. This is a spirit-led um, uh, awareness of God's presence. And, and yet, you know, Jesus um, realized that he himself was not the end point of, of what God, God's promises, right? I must go, the Gospel of John says, so that the spirit may come. And therefore, this notion of suffering, death, and new life is very much consonant with what evolution is about. Nothing stays the same. Um, all life must eventually let go, suffer, and die so that new life may emerge. Um, and I think this is part of the process of Christogenesis. So what you know, Teilhard brings to us is that we're part of this evolutionary process. We're part of an ongoing cosmic process that demands our commitment to it. New wine must be put into new wineskins. 
we read this, we hear it, we know it, but yet we have to ask ourselves, what does the new wineskin mean for us? Um, and part of it is coming to our awareness as a co-creator, that God will not bring about a new world apart from us, uh, that it requires our total involvement. Um, and that involvement requires a total gift of our lives in freedom as to birth the future that is most wholesome for the nature that has birthed us. A co-creator is just not creating oneself, but creating the whole evolutionary and ecologic reality to which we belong. Now, interestingly, Teilhard felt that Christianity was the religion of evolution um, and not just a religion that could be um, uh, synthesized with evolution. He wrote at one point, in the future, the only religion possible is the religion which will teach us in the very first place to recognize, love, and serve with passion the universe of which we form a part. And of course, in his view, Christianity fit the bill. It took materiality seriously. And I think Francis of Assisi had something of this notion in his own writings and in his own life. Um, that, you know, if we are to go to God, we must go to God through the earth and not apart from the earth. So Teilhard had this maxim, faith in God, faith in the world, and faith in God in and through the world. And, and that's a question for us. You know, I think we're pretty good on the faith in God part. But I think we, we, we don't have a faith in the world because we feel that the world is out of control, that the world will come to an end. And we don't realize that God is creating this world in and through us. Uh, we have faith in the world if we have faith in the God who's creating in and through the world. And therefore, Teilhard also saw the church not just as a place to worship God, for sure, but even more so, uh, the church he saw as a new phylum. That's a, that's a taxonic, uh, taxonomy uh, biological taxonomy that says this is a new type of person, a new type of community is emerging here. And so he said, not a teaching church so much as a living church, a church that is spearheading this evolutionary process so that we're not being redeemed from a fallen world. We are in a sense being made whole uh, by helping to fulfill the world's potentialities. Um, and therefore Teilhard himself, you know, uh, also, like Francis, um, spoke of this as a sacramental world, but the sacrament of our own lives being part of that um, royal priesthood to which everyone is called to. As an ordained priest, Teilhard, of course, was in the deserts of China and had no, no capacity to celebrate the Mass and therefore wrote his Mass on the world where he said, over every living thing, which is to spring up, to grow, to flower, to ripen this day. Again, the words, this is my body. Um, Francis in his own way, with his deep devotion, uh, you might say, and the centriety of the Eucharist for Francis, you know, wrote in his letter to the order, hold back nothing of yourselves for yourselves, that he who gives himself totally to you may receive you totally. Receiving totally, meaning to give up our bodies, this is my body. Uh, meaning our, our, our work, our joys, our sufferings, our anxieties, everything is offered up um, in this Christi Christification of the universe. And therefore, my last part is, you know, Teilhard and Francis of Assisi come to a deep sense and vision of God immersed in our world, God enfolding our world, God doing something new in our world, through, I think, um, their acts of contemplation. The Buddha once said, the mind is everything, what you think you become. A very wise insight that is apropos to Francis and, and Teilhard. Contemplation, as many of us probably practice centering prayer, it maximizes consciousness. It centrates us um, by, by stripping away all the noise and the frivolities that get in the way of concentrating on the one important thing. And therefore it can open our eyes to the ineffable depth of matter. To contemplate is not to withdraw from the world, it's to see the world from a new center, to become one in heart with 
the moon and the stars and even the chaotic movements of life where God is dynamically creating and attracting toward more life. And by entering into this oneness, we move from our isolated partial selves to a, to a selfless self, a self that's part of the whole um, so that our lives and, and the world in which we're living becomes in a sense united in a new dynamic whole. Um, Beatrice Bruteau said, you know, the more conscious the individual becomes, the more the individual becomes person. And we become person by freely living by the life of the whole. And I think this is very true of Francis of Assisi. And for both Francis and Teilhard, both mystics, um, they went about the world urging all things toward unity because they saw God dynamically present and, and loving the world into something new. And therefore both contributed to evolution through a process of mystical convergence, seeing everything bound in this web of love. And that, that's how God is born into the world, when our minds and hearts expand in love. God born in us, through us, into the universe, and therefore the world itself moves closer towards that fullness of Christ, that omega where God is all in all. But I think, you know, the type of contemplation that, you know, I'm just holding out here, which would take a lot more time to enter into, is a particular, I think, charism of Francis of Assisi that is not attended to sufficiently. He did withdraw from the world, but he had a dynamic relation to the world. Similarly, so did Teilhard de Jardin, who spent long periods of time in the deserts uh, digging up old bones. But as they deepened their lives in this, in this presence of God, they came to a place of interior freedom, a place where they could see the world and, and allow themselves to see the world from a new depth. And that gave them, that freedom gave them a sense of creativity, of doing new things, of, of moving towards the future in a new way. And therefore contemplation is to hand oneself over in the very act of contemplation, to become an energetic, to energize the world by what we see. So what Teilhard said is that we are the ongoing incarnation of God, very similar to Francis of Assisi, where he wrote, we are mothers when we carry him in our heart and body and give birth to him. Both mystics see that there is no God alive in this world apart from us. And our task in our own age, if we are to build the earth into a new earth, is to realize that becoming the Christ, in other words, allowing this God to take root in our lives, to turn us in a new direction, to put on Christ, um, and therefore to act from a new center of this Christic center, is not what we do. I think we're entirely too pragmatic and we want to do things. And that lands us actually back in the old Newtonian universe. We objectify everything. The world of evolution is a world of being in relationship. And we are called to be in a relationship in a new way. As the saying goes, if we want a different world, we must become a different people. And that's what I see with uh, Francis and Terre de Chardin. Um, that they lived out of faith and freedom because they lived in and through the divine energies of love. Beatrice Bruteau said, creativity may be seen as the real interior map meaning of the act of faith. The act of uniting with the living one as living, not dead, as not bound by the past, but as transcendent, free and creating. Christ is emerging through us. That, that is the point here. Um, and as, as Beatrice said, you know, to enter by our transcendent freedom into Christ and to become a new creation means to enter by faith into the future of every person and into the very heart of creativity itself, into the future of God. And it would take a lot more than, uh, the, the, I'm out of time as it is, but to really break this open for us, but we have to, you know, we have to realize that, and I think this is what Francis realized, that this Christ not only is, but is coming to be. So that as Bhutto writes, if you ask, who do you say I am? My answer is you are the new and ever renewing act of creation. 
You are all of us as we are united in you. You are all of us as we live in one another. You are all of us in the whole cosmos as we join in your exuberant act of creation. You are the living one who improvises at the frontier of the future, and it has not yet appeared what you shall be. Francis himself intuited that in his own way. Uh, deep within his heart, he knew that he had done what was his to do. I have done what was mine to do. May Christ teach, what, teach you what is yours. That is not a pious statement in our own age. That is our reality. We must wake up into a new freedom of love uh, to let go when the right time comes, to engage new structures of relationships, and to live with hope in the world that this world can become a new world because God is at the heart of it. Thanks. What a beautiful way to end. Thank you, Sister Elia, for your lecture. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. Let us give Sister Elia a collective applause. Yeah.